Proverbs chapter 28, and we'll continue our study there from verse 19. He who tills his land will have plenty of food, but he who follows empty pursuits will have plenty of poverty. There's a contrast there between plenty of food and plenty of poverty. And in the Good News Bible, that verse reads like this. A hard-working farmer has plenty to eat, whereas people who waste their time will always be poor. Of course, we want to apply this verse spiritually, because in the New Testament, the farmer spoken of is um, the believer. As we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6, the hard-working farmer is the first to receive his share of the crops. And that applies to how hard we work on our own salvation. And we are told also in James chapter 5, verse 7, to be patient because the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it. And so we find this applies to us in the New Testament in terms of diligence in our own spiritual life. And the opposite of diligence, a diligent farmer, is described here in verse 19 as those who waste their time. And uh, that can be a very bad habit among believers. Basically, when we are converted, we can say that all of us waste a tremendous amount of time. But there is an area where every one of us needs to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling so that increasingly in our life we, the wastage of time becomes less and less and less and less and less. And that is uh, uh, not an easy thing to do. But if you read the biographies of some of the greatest men of God that have lived through the years, you'll find that they had learned to discipline their time so that there was very little of time wasted for useless things. Now, when we talk about useless things, we don't mean that if you go out to relax in the park with your children, that that's a waste of time. In fact, that can be a very useful thing for body and for fellowship with the children. We don't say that the only useful way to spend our time is always reading the Bible and praying. There are many other useful things to do, but it's a question of priorities. If a man doesn't have time to read the Word and to pray, then of course there needs to be something cut out from his life so that he finds time for these things. There's a tremendous amount of waste of time that we can avoid if we are really diligent to ask God for grace to help us to get rid of this bad habit. Tremendous amount of time can be wasted sometimes in useless conversation. In a lot of visiting homes that ends up in waste of time. And that's why we need to discipline ourselves even in visiting one another. Verse 20. The pursuit of wealth, this verse tells us, brings a punishment. A faithful man will abound with blessings. But he who makes haste to be rich, that means who is very eager to be rich, will not go unpunished. Now the blessings spoken of in verse 20, the first part, we can say are all that we need for our earthly life. And through these years I have come to see one thing. That if a person puts God's kingdom first, God blesses him in earthly things. When those blessings go beyond a certain limit, much more than we need, what happens is, those blessings become a curse. And that's why John Wesley said, it's good to say, earn all we can and save all we can. But if we don't learn to give and if we don't learn to use what God gives us for his glory, after a while, this accumulation of wealth, the thing which is once a blessing, 
becomes a curse. A blessing is when God gives us enough for our needs. And the faithful man will abound with blessings. He has no shortage of it. He has, always has enough for all his needs and his family's needs. But one who is just intent on making more and more wealth, he will be punished. And what is the punishment he's going to get? We read in 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 that one, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's the punishment. That those who are eager to get rich unnecessarily is not talking about those who are trying to earn their living and get something for their family's needs but for those who are in the pursuit of wealth way beyond their needs they fall into a temptation and a trap, the trap there of the devil, many foolish and harmful desires. What are these foolish and harmful desires? That when they have more, they begin to have desires for all types of foolish and harmful things for themselves and their children, which plunge them into ruin and destruction. You see evidences of that all around. You find that the children of the very rich people are usually um, spoiled all types of foolish and harmful things which their parents never knew how to keep from them. <clears throat> so that's part of the punishment. It says he who makes haste to rich will not go unpunished. He sees the punishment in his own children being ruined spiritually. He sees the punishment in his own life being uh, caught in a trap of the devil and so many other things. Verse 21. <clears throat> to show partiality is not good because for a piece of bread a man will transgress. Now partiality is one of the things that James warns us of in James chapter 2. In the church he says, if you favor the rich or someone who is a big shot and put aside someone who is poor, you are sinning. James chapter 2 he says you sin when you are partial. It's a serious sin. And he goes on to say in James chapter 3 towards the end that one of the characteristics of wisdom is that it has no partiality. And that's another thing that does not go away from us as soon as we are converted. Partiality is still in us. Partiality towards one child over another child in the family. We can get the victory over that uh, as we get light on it. But it's more difficult to get victory over partiality towards one brother and against another brother. That's a little more difficult to get rid of. But that's always an indication as long as I'm partial towards one and um, against another that is a constant revelation to me that I have not yet partaken of the divine nature in this area and it's a sad thing if year after year after year after year goes by and I haven't partaken of divine nature in this one area of being impartial God is impartial that does not mean that uh, we will not be drawn more to some who are more spiritually minded of course but it's not a partiality based on something human. That my temperament is that way or my community is that or some, I like someone because he's like me in so many ways. That's a human partiality which we need to cleanse ourselves from. First, to be show partiality is not good. And then it says for a piece of bread a man will transgress which means some people will do wrong even for the smallest amount of profit. They'll be, they show partiality like a judge showing partiality for a small bribe. Now in the book of Micah, there's a very interesting verse which reads like this. Micah and chapter 3 verse 5. I want to read it from the Living Bible. Micah 3 verse 5 where Micah is prophesying against the false prophets. And he says, you false prophets, you who lead his people, God's people, astray. You who cry peace. That means you who preach, saying everything's all right with you, to those who give you food and threaten those who will not pay you. A lot of preachers like that, even in Micah's day, who, if somebody gave them a handsome gift, they would never rebuke such a brother or correct him and they would only say nice things to him but someone who never gave them a gift they'd really feel free to rebuke such people you see there were such preachers 
even in Micah's day, and Micah exposed them. He says, you preach peace. That is partiality towards those who give you bread, to those who give you food. Somebody invites you for a meal and you don't feel free to rebuke him. It's very interesting to see in Luke chapter 7 how there was this man called Simon the Pharisee who invited Jesus for uh, a meal. And before Jesus even ate the meal almost, he rebuked him. Jesus was never going to be bribed by a meal. That's what it says here. Some people can be bribed just by a meal. A meal is enough to make them partial. Here is where we have to become wise, that we do not allow ourselves to be bribed by gifts or food or anything because God has called us to partake of his nature, which is completely impartial. It's not partial towards, you see, for example, somebody uh, who hates me does something right and I can't appreciate it. And someone who loves me very much, is very kind to me, does something wrong. And uh, I find it quite easy to be merciful to him. There I'm partial. I don't see right and wrong, clearly. I'm like that man whose eyes were half opened, who saw men like trees walking. I don't see right and wrong. What do I see? I see who likes me and who does not like me. And brothers and sisters, as long as we are operating on that level, we have to say to ourselves, I have not partaken of the divine nature. I'm not operating on the basis of right and wrong like God does. I'm operating on the basis of, is he, do I like this brother? Do I not like that brother? That's partiality. We have to cleanse ourselves from it. Verse 23. We read here. Uh, sorry, verse 22. A man with an evil eye hastens after wealth and does not know that want will come upon him. And uh, this again refers to what we considered earlier, the folly of trying to make money quickly that tempts us to go into all types of unrighteous ways of making money. And he does not know that finally he will become poor. And it speaks of here about the evil eye. You know, Jesus spoke about your eye being evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. And here Jesus, here the word of God speaks about an evil eye. The man with an evil eye is the man who has got his heart set on money. And you compare that with what Jesus said about if your eye is not good, your whole body is full of darkness. A man can run after money and however much he may believe the right doctrine, his whole body gradually becomes full of darkness. That's one mark of an evil eye, that he hastens after wealth. What's the mark of a man with an evil eye? This verse tells us. He hastens after wealth. He doesn't believe that God will allow it to come his way. If your eye is clear, your whole body is full of light. That means your eye is not always coveting. See, it's with our eyes that we covet. What I see there, what that person has, what the other thing, the other thing here, the other thing there. And I really need to cleanse my eyes from this type of covetousness and come to contentment so that I can see something that I don't desire. I'm quite free from it. If God wants me to have something, he'll give it to me. If he doesn't, I'm not interested. I'm going to seek the kingdom of God first in any case. It's righteousness. Verse 23, He who rebukes a man will afterwards find more favor than he who flatters with the tongue. This is one of those things repeated a number of times in Proverbs that rebuke is always better than flattery. Now even though it doesn't look like that in the beginning, yet in the long run and certainly in eternity, we'll find that there was absolutely no profit that came out of, out of our flattering people. We flatter people only for our own gain usually, for we want some favor from that person or we want that person to, be, uh, to have a good opinion of us or we want that person to think that we are very gentle and we know how to praise people and all this is usually for some personal gain that we flatter. But uh, nobody will rebuke for personal gain. We really need to be free from seeking our own if we are to be free from flattery. For flattery can take various forms in our life where we say or do something in order to give a person the impression that he's someone we think highly of him and I'll, I, underneath I have some ulterior motive. But if we seek to correct and rebuke, it says here, 
afterwards, not immediately. You'll find that there's a greater profit from it and a greater blessing. And even if some people don't appreciate you right now, at the judgment seat of Christ, they will come to you and say, thank you brother, thank you sister, for not flattering me, but for telling me the truth straight to my face. And if we are willing to wait for our thanks till the judgment seat of Christ, we will do what is right.